you're the the dog in the dog and pony show i i'm the saddle yes <laughs> i i i don't i don't know what to do with that information you're the dog and un- pony. okay okay <laughs> it, i mm-hmm, i think we'll leave it there so good morning everybody <laughs> we've got this set up i guess a little bit different than usual and we're off to a little bit of a late start so that just means i'll speak even faster i'll catch us back up uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Here we are, uh, end of October 2020. Things are still crazy and, and fun and weird and all that wildness that we've got going on right now. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Dennis, anything you yep. want to Welcome, everybody. It's been a great season. A lot of information for us here at Tiny. Yep. I hope all you growers also had a wonderful season. And, you know, today uh, we want to talk a little bit about... Uh, some of the problems we saw this year, I guess, based on drought and water levels yeah. and all those types of things. So this uh, year, last year, the year before, five yeah. years from now. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a continuing it's a, problem. And, and looking at, I mean, some of the research, it's one of the areas that globally they're recognizing that drought stress is going to be one of the primary concerns that the world is facing. As more and more people are using more and more water, that means that more and more water is more and more contaminated. I feel like I should use the word more 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 a little more so yeah it's it is a real problem and the hard part is it's a difficult problem to deal with so it's something that we've been we've been helping with i mean we don't have i i wouldn't describe it as a solution we have um products and techniques and a program i guess program is what we usually talk we have programs to help people um, get the most out of what's pretty much a, a bad situation so we're, we're, we're here to help. And if you have questions, we'd love to hear them. Although with our screen up, um, it's gonna be a little bit different. It might take me a minute to get to the questions cause I don't have the chat bar up. So with that, I'm gonna kind of jump in and get the party started, I think. Share screen. I didn't do that before. I don't think anything has changed. Dennis, did you notice anything change? Nope. Are we okay? We're going to go to full screen. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Here we are again, uh, talking a little bit about drought stress. Um, so starting it off, I was going through slides and had had a good chuckle. This is an old slide. Um, and this one back to when my son, Bat Sam, you can see him dressed in his, his bat mask, which, oh man, he used to wear all year, all the time, everywhere. Uh, here we are. This is, this is downtown Spokane. We went to the top of the parking garage. This is at the mall. I mean, this is one of the major malls, major shopping areas in Spokane. He's bat masked up. He's, and it he's wasn't Halloween. Oh no, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I mean, it could, it, it's summer, it's winter, it's fall. You, you name a season and he's Batman. So... I used to sing the song, you know, everybody, da, 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 the, the Batman song. And at one point, Dad, he turned to me, Dad, who's Banana, ba- banana Batman? I was like, what are you talking Oh, da, 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 da. it sounds like banana to him. So. Well, and I will give you, uh, I mean, this slide is perfect because if you go through the Batman song, there are the perfect numbers. Na 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 Batman. I know, and it just happens to fit with sodium. All that sodium. I know. I love it. Talking about sodium today. Ooh, rough transition. <laughs> so again, talking a little bit about. So I'm going to go through some of the basics of water. What What are some of the basics? Of water. Why does it interact the way that it does with different salts? What are salts? What are ions? Some of the, that uh, kind of house cleaning house cleaning kind of basic information, um, a little bit about plant farming, PGPR, uh, rhizophagy cycle, uh, and then PGPR functions and how do they function in regards to abiotic or environmental stress, non-living, abiotic means non-living stresses, and a few field examples. So some of the basics, very beginning, water is it's just straight up magic. It is super bizarre. It has properties that very few other um, materials. Gallium is another one that as it freezes, it expands. So that's, that's a fun little factoid there. Um, but water, as it freezes, expands, it reaches its greatest density at zero degrees Celsius, four degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, but one of the things that really makes life as we know it possible is the fact that water is polar. And by polar, that means it has poles. Uh, it has a positive and negative pole associated with the elements that make it up, hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen has a very strong affinity for electrons called electro, electron affinity, uh, electronegativity, and it wants to attract electrons to itself. On the other side of that, the hydrogen, they're happy to donate those electrons. And once you get rid of those electrons, which are a negative charge, then you have a positive charge left over. So oxygen has a negative charge because of all the electrons it likes to soak up. And the hydrogen side is happy to give those up. Um, so it ends up with a positive charge. And you can it's not like magnets, but the easiest way to think about that is kind of like magnets where if I have a south pole facing a south pole, they push apart. If I have a north facing a south, they attract. They're, they're, they're excited to hang out together. Um, and so because of that, water is able to attract itself to itself. Um, and so we can have clusters, we can have structures, we have what's called hydrogen bonding. Uh, and that's what allows our, um, our capillary action and allows basically our plants to be able to suck water from the roots all the way up in the leaves, um, hundreds of feet potentially. But it also has an impact on how it reacts with different chemical structures. So in this case, we're talking about salt and this salt is sodium chloride. Sodium has a positive charge and chloride in an ion form, and I'll touch on ions in a minute, has a negative charge. So those different elements are attracted. I don't know if that's highlighting, but you can see the chloride with the negative charge being attracted to the hydrogen. The hydrogen has a positive end and the sodium is attracted to the oxygen end. But that basically allows just like a magnet would be able to pull stuff off, like you know, pick up your paper clips. The water molecules in essence are kind of picking up and moving those ions around and water is known as the universal solvent and a solvent is basically just a dissolving agent a solute is the substance being dissolved salt or sodium chloride table salt is a lot of what we're talking about and a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances so when we have our water we have our sodium we have our chloride we're creating a solution of those things those ions as the water rips it apart now, ions and salts. What are ions? The short answer is ions are charged particles. Cations are positively charged, like the sodium. Anions are negatively charged, like the chloride. Uh, and it's more than just sodium chloride. I know that I'm focusing mostly on sodium chloride, but pretty much anything that falls apart in water, um, or not even just water, um, falls apart into ions in a solution can generally be considered uh, an ionic form. So your sulfate forms um, will oftentimes fall apart into ion forms, having a positive and negative um, with your sulfate being that negatively charged. So it's not just sodium chloride. So many, many, many different uh, elements can be considered salts. Salts are just made up of those ions that like to fall apart. And interestingly enough, all five tastes can be sensed through different salts. Uh, and not all salts are soluble in water. Some are alcohol, some are oil. So depending on what it's made up of, some fall apart in water, some do not. Uh, and there I believe it's copper sulfate uh, in the hand down below. I just love this, this mine in Poland, the Wailitska. I don't know, I probably mispronounced that. But it is hundreds of feet deep and it is all salt. It is hundreds of year old a uh, salt mine and all of that beauty that you see etched and carved around um, those, those people in that area, it's all salt based. Uh, and the interesting thing here is when we have these ions, ions allow a charge uh, and they allow electricity to go through and electrolytes conductivity is the connection there. So conductivity is the uh, conductance uh, of electricity. Um, and plants and animals have to have these charged ions to create electrical potential across membranes. Our mitochondria that produces all of the energy, most pretty much all the energy for our bodies, it creates a hydrogen gradient across the membrane, which turns the ATPase, which generates ATP. 
ATP, as we've talked before, are the little batteries. And plants are doing the same thing. But in this case, they're using, uh, inside of their chloroplast, they're creating a charge potential across the membrane in the chloroplast that allows the sunlight's energy to be captured, um, split the water apart, and then generate basically trickle down to, to charge and uh, run Calvin cycle um, to generate energy and to run Krebs cycle and to develop the, the sugars that we know and love and use on a regular basis. So when we talk about water in plants, a lot of times we can think about that as turgor pressure. How full or empty are the vacuoles inside of the plant's cell? The plant cells are surrounded by a cell wall, so they have a really nice structure. It's kind of like a house. And if I was to put a gigantic balloon inside of this room and really, really inflate it, the walls themselves would keep it pretty much in shape um, and keep it mostly from bursting. Um, and then if you were to let a lot of the air out, it kind of shrink back down. So that's kind of the idea, I kind of think about it like a balloon, inflated or deflated, and that has to do with the vacuoles. And the vacuole is a kind of sort storage structure inside the plant cell. It holds a lot of water, um, but it also holds a lot of ions. It holds a lot of nutrients. So the plant can store calcium, phosphorus, and other materials um, in there. And as the, the cells are, or as the plant is exposed to an adequate amount of water, I, it's like a Goldilocks zone. Too much water inside of the plant's vacuum, inside the plant cell is bad. Too little water inside of the plant cell is also bad. So a turgid cell is kind of right in the middle where it's well inflated, but not inflated to the point where it's going to burst. Uh, the opposite side of that, when the plant gets thirsty, uh, the, the, the vacuoles release their water to help supply water to the plant. And then we see wilting. We see an empty flaccid, uh, flaccid cell, uh, empty vacuole, and a wilted plant. Uh, and this has to do with what's going on, not only with how much water have we supplied to the plant, but also the salts. How, how salty is the environment around it? How much water does the plant have to move around to keep its cells hydrated? So in general, uh, 300 to 1,000 microsiemens per centimeter is a pretty good range in soil. A uh, thousand seems a little high, usually, uh, you know, six, seven, eight hundred seems to be a, a pretty good upper limit. But I, I've, I've read and seen and talked to some people that go as high as a thousand. So depending on the soil type, texture, I can see going a little bit higher being better if you've got a really light, sandy soil, um, having a, a high conductivity, having a high um, uh, microsiemen per centimeter is, is going to be more of a challenge than if I have a higher CEC soil that can basically hold more. I have more, more sponge, more resilience there. So when does salt become a problem? And salt becomes a problem when, like most things, in moderation, if the balance becomes off. And what we talk about when the balance gets off is osmotic pressure, osmotic control. And that's the plant's ability to keep moisture inside of those vacuoles, inside of those cells. So a hypertonic condition, hypertonic solution, is the concentration outside of the cell of solutes of materials that are in the suspension, in the solution, is higher, so water flushes out. Because osmosis is all about creating balance. Uh, hypotonic would be like if you watered your plant with distilled water, there's a much higher concentration of stuff inside of the vacuole, inside of the plant, than in the distilled water, which basically contains only water. So to balance that out, a ton of water is going to flood in to those cells to try to create that balance. And that's what osmosis and osmotic pressure is basically all about, is creating balance. If I have a whole lot of salt in one area and very little salt in another area, and they're both aqueous environments, wet environments, the water from this area is going to flood into the high salt area to balance that out. Uh, and we can measure that with electrical conductivity, EC. And we can think about that as the soil's constitution or energy flow. If it's excessively low, then there's low energy flow in the soil. Uh, zero to 1.5 is generally considered, you know, a little on the low side but to, to good. 1.6 to 3.5 millimoles per centimeter is getting to that high range. So zero to 1.5 is the area that you generally wanna be. If you're at zero um, EC in your soil, you have very few ions, you have very little salt, very little charge, so there's very little energy flow. 
When we get above that and the 3.6 and above, that is considered a very salty environment and very few plants uh, except for salt tolerant plants are going to grow very well there. So we're, we're trying to keep that balance um, and we're trying to keep that moderation in check to keep our water flow where we want it. If we have too much salt outside of the cells, water is going to rush to balance that out. And that's kind of the easy way to think about it is we, to, to create that balance, the water is going to rush to where concentration is lowest. So when it gets too salty, then we have that rush. We have diffusion. Uh, and diffusion is where the water wants to go from high concentration to low concentration. So if I have a lot of salt in my soil, a lot of the water inside the plant is going to rush down out of the plants into the soil to create that balance. And that's osmotic pressure. And that's that's the balance that we get through diffusion, just water moving. Um, and then we end up with wilted plants. To get the water back into the plant, uh, it's an energetically uphill battle. The plant has to use active transport, it has to use energy rather than just diffusion and osmosis to force the water back up against the gradient. So that can become energetically costly to the plant. So that's great, interesting, I love all that, ion, salt, conductivity. Um, but what does that have to do with microbes? And that's kind of where we're, we're getting, all that's preamble, uh, pre-discussion, trying to lay the foundation of, you know, what is salts, what are ions, what is all this going on? Um, and then we finally get to the idea of what can microbes do? And here I have highlighted uh, the idea of abiotic stress. And that's where the, what we're going to talk about the rest of this time is how microbes can help that plant overcome the environment that we have created, nature has created, or has been created in some other way that has created um, a solution in the soil that's too salty. So the water wants to uh, remain there. The plant has a great deal of difficulty moving that water from the soil up into, I guess people can't see me moving. And no, your with my hands, hands are perfect. My hands are, my hands are all over the place. Very tired I know, but this. nobody can see that. You're not going to need yoga. <laughs> It's all free entertainment, Dennis. Oh, boy. So salt microbes and rhizophagy. We, we talk rhizophagy several times, and that's the you know quick summary. That's the cycle where microbes are great miners. They're in the soil extracting nutrition from the environments. Um, they're storing it inside their bodies. The meristem, the growing tip of the root, microbes go in through that area. The plant blasts it, bombards it cracks those microbes open, sucks out the nutrients, and then it spits them back out. But the other side is that is these microbes also have to have water as well. Microbes need water in order to survive, to thrive, to grow, to do all the things that they're trying to do and reproduce. So inside of those microbe cells, some water along with that nutrition. So the plant's going to be getting a little bit of that water as well. Um, so we can think about that way. Along with the nutrition, um, the, the 10 to 2 plus traces, these little micro pills the plant's taking up. It's also getting a little bit of water along with it. But the idea of, oh boy, those got messed up, um, the, the aggregate building. So as those microbes are being spit back out by the plant, um, creating those little root hairs, the, the micro root hairs, um, it's generating, that's where we're getting our synthesis, our soil synthesis, and there, that's where we're getting our micro aggregation forming. And it's this micro aggregation, um, it's these dreadlocks that really are kind of holding the answer to how a big part of how the plant can survive in these environments. Because we talked before about the idea of pH, but inside this rhizosheath, this zone right around the root, these dreadlock zones, is an entirely different environment. Uh, and I was talking with Dennis and we were kind of discussing it and it, it almost feels like this is like a biological filter. This is the microbes working with the plants, with the exudates the plant is producing um, to create this unusual, almost completely different zone. It's an alien world. I mean, just like our house, it can be freezing cold outside. You come inside, it can be nice and warm and comfortable. This rhizo sheath uh, kind of holds the answer, it creates this environment, creates this zone that is totally different. So the microbes are able to use that as a filter to keep a lot of 
things they don't want out. It becomes an area for them to mine efficiently. Gas exchange is great in that aggregated uh, zone. Uh, moisture extraction is easier, but not only that, we're gonna get into some of these other functions the microbes can do, uh, these PGPR, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, in that zone. So the, the aerial plants, the above ground plant parts of the plants, as they're living in a salty environment and they interact with the PGPR, um, they can have increased water conductance, conductance to aerial parts. So having these microbes allows the plant to uptake more water. Um, a better ionic homeostasis, better balance. Uh, and these microbes, like we talked about with rhizophagy, taking up the nutrition, soaking up potassium in particular, um, and giving that to the plant. Potassium is critical for sugar movement, and we'll talk about osmolites here a little bit, um, but also for stomata opening and closing, that potassium is critical for that stomata. Uh, it'll also allow improved tolerance and decreased senescence and increase osmoprotectants and antioxidant protectant, increase photosynthesis and growth and yields, uh, nutrient acquisition, phosphate solubilization. So even in these salty environments, these microbes, like we talked about, they're the miners. They're extracting this nutrition, not only for themselves, but then they're able to feed it to the plant. Uh, it better able to maintain a water balance, maintain ionic homeostasis, uh, and this rhizosheath excess polysaccharides, that we, that's kind of what we were just talking about. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the volatile organic compounds. Uh, and um, I think that this one is supposed to be highlighted, the antioxidant production. So these microbes growing around that environment is what allows these plants to basically function in a world that is foreign. I mean, it's not what the, the, the bulk soil around them actually is. And that's in big part due to this rhizosheath, this design that the microbes are creating. They want a house that's comfortable for them to live in. And if the plant is comfortable, it's going to be able to photosynthesize more. More photosynthesis means more sugar, means more growth. So this, this is a feedback loop where as the microbes make the soil around the root a little healthier for the plants, give the plant a little more nutrition, a little more moisture, the plant rewards them with more sugar. Um, and a big part of the way that these microbes are doing it is through the production of extracellular polysaccharides, EPSs. And in general, you can think about them as sugars. I mean, this is kind of like, you know, producing a marmalade, producing a jam. It glues everything together and it creates the aggregates. Now, interestingly enough, um, research is showing that it's not just binding these particles together, but the microbes can purposely put sodium into that aggregate. So while they're building this structure, while they're building these little houses, um, it's, it's almost like putting garbage into the wall of the house and hiding it in there as insulation. So it's packing that with sodium and binding it up so that it's less available, less of a problem in the environment. And kind of like we're talking, it's, it's the idea of a filter. It's using this, this um, rhizosheath environment as a bit of a filter and it's, it's creating a physical barrier. Um, and that's what that biofilm, the biofilm is the sugar, the EPS that the microbes are producing, functioning to create the rhizosheath. And this is a newer one. I was pretty, it was pretty fun kind of stumbling across this and researching a little bit, need to dig into this more. But the idea is IST, we've talked about ISR, induced systemic resistance. And that's where basically the microbes are protected from outside threats. And due systemic tolerance is the microbes basically communicating with the plant. And the more research comes out and the more we look into this, the more we see um, this is just a highway. This is a back and forth communication. Uh, we've talked about the, the plant secondary microbiome, all these microbes living on and around the plant. It is, it, there's massive amounts of communication going back and forth. And we're just starting to understand that. And so one of these interactions it, through this induced systemic tolerance is the plants inoculated with plant growth promoting rhizobacteria induce morphological and biochemical modifications resulting in enhanced tolerance, tolerance to abiotic stress defined as induced systemic tolerance. So just by having these microbes around, the communication back and forth between the plant and the microbe basically cues, just like the ISR cues the plant up to be ready to protect itself from threats. The IST allows the plants to grow through these stress times more easily. And it's not quite like the ACC deaminase we've talked about in the past, 
um, which is there to reduce the ethylene levels and slow senescence in the plant. But it's somewhat similar. It's a communication pathway. Um, the, the, the ethylene pathways, the hormone pathways in the plant um, are critical and hormones are basically just communication. So this is a different type of communication and they understand it somewhat, this IST, but I think that there's still a lot of research that's uh, emerging and coming out to help elucidate what's really going on and how those, um, those microbes are truly communicating with the plant. Uh, yeah, secondarily, we've talked about ACCDMNase. Again, that's cutting the ethylene down, um, reducing the stress load in the plants. And another thing that the microbes are doing is they're producing osmoprotectants themselves, osmoprotectants, osmosis protectants, another way to think about it. Uh, osmosis is the loss of water. Again, high salt is low water. So the water is going to flow to those areas. So these osmolites like trehalose, proline, glycine, betaine that the microbes are producing, not only that, but they also cue the plant up to produce more of these osmolites themselves. And these osmolites are there to basically reduce the amount of damage that that drought stress would cause. Um, I've talked before about the tune state of the little water bears, um, and that's basically what they're doing. They're producing massive amounts of trehalose to protect themselves. So the osmolites are there, and they're protecting the DNA from damage, proteins from damage, and they're reducing the oxidative stress, oxidative damage that would otherwise happen in the plant because without that water flushing these, these, uh, these oxidants out, the plant would, be, would receive more damage. So these are kind of like sponges soaking up what would otherwise cause damage so that the plant can grow again more normally. It doesn't have to go through and fix the proteins, fix the DNA. And if you have severe protein or DNA degradation, then the plant cells start to die themselves. So these osmoprotectants are, are pretty critical in allowing the plant to grow through. It's kind of like a fireproof shield that allows it to survive through um, more, <laughs> more potential fire damage. Uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds. And, and this, these are basically just the gases, the breath quote unquote breath that the microbes are breathing that communicate with the plants. And again, it's this highway, it's this conversation that we barely understand. We, we don't understand the language very well yet, but we're starting to capture snippets. We don't have the Rosetta Stone, but we're, we're understanding bits of it. Um, but these, this chemical communication back and forth, having the microbes, the PGPR down in the root, breathing these volatiles out, it allows the plant to upregulate and downregulate, upregulating genes um, to increase the shoot to root sodium translocation. So it allows the plant to take more of the sodium that it's taken up, spit it back out into the environment where again, those microbes creating that rhizosheath, creating that zone can then bind some of that up into their body, creating um, uh, sodium kind of hot spots and, and sacrificial areas, or binding it up into the, the aggregates through the extracellular polysaccharides. And not only that, they're also down-regulating um, the uptake of sodium. So they're allowing the plant to produce more proteins to protect itself from sodium. So again, we talked about this is energetically expensive, but if the plant gets a heads up, and these issues, these stresses are coming through this. It's kind of like a phone call. So, you know, it's a buddy way out ahead of you giving you a phone call. Hey, watch out. There's a, there's a power line down in the road. You better be careful, slow down and watch yourself. It's kind of what these microbes are doing. So if the plant initially takes up less of the sodium, it has less of it to deal with. So by upregulating um, these proteins and molecules that restrict the flow of sodium into the plant, Long-term impact is the plant then has to deal with less of it. And we've talked a bit about it before. Again, that's not, we're not talking about months and months. It's not that we can get away without watering our plants ever again, just by having PGPR down there. But we are talking about creating that rhizosheath, creating that zone of protection. It's like a sponge or a Band-Aid. And it'll take you really far in some cases in this research, uh, an extra two weeks under drought stress um, so these microbes can help take you farther to help the plants grow through, but it's not going to fix it. 
uh, indefinitely. And here's kind of a, a sum up of all the different things or some of the different things that we just uh, talked about. Nutrient uptake, cytokine in production, antioxidant defense, um, and that's uh, partially through some of the osmolites, ACC deaminase, and here we can see the extracellular polysaccharides binding the sodium um, into that soil environment. And Amy absolutely hated this slide, and it is a mess, I agree, but these were just kind of the points, and as I went through some of the research backing up some of the previous slides, so there's, there's a lot that goes um, into finding the information, um, but there is a lot of information out there. And when Dennis and I were looking through this, he kind of pointed out, look at the years on most of these. I mean, 2017, 2018, uh, 2016, 2017, some of it goes back to you know a decade ago, but most of this research is all really fairly new. And that's part of what makes me so excited to see what's kind of what's gonna come next. Whew. Man, a lot of information. That was, that so was, that was a lot of words. So often people ask me, so how does the DS work and how does it function? And Steve just really simply put it in the Reader's Digest version of how it works. There's a whole lot more there. We could spend a whole lot more time on any one of those topics. Yeah. Digging deep into, okay, so what genes are upregulated? What genes are downregulated? What does that cause in turn? But I mean... It gets pretty pretty heavy pretty quick. So trying to keep this a little lighter, trying to keep this kind of kind of fun. I think it's fun. I think it's just unbelievably cool information. That's what keeps it kind of fun to me. But the fact that there's so much new information coming around. I mean, this uh, the, the it used to be Spectrum Extra. We call it the Spectrum DS. This product has been around for a long time. We've been utilizing microbes to help augment and supplement the plants and how they grow for literally decades. And, and that part of a little bit about the difference in the spectrum line, and we talk about the specific function, we still have the platform or the foundation, Correct. but there's an emphasis placed on when we have high sodium environments or we have salt yeah. stress or we have any of those things that we're talking about here today is the idea is, is to put that biological package out there, which is going to give us the most benefit based on function. And that's really how you develop the spectrum extra, which is now DS. So we want yeah. to kind of talk about that a little bit um, and, and why it functions the way that it does in these environments. Yeah. And that's, that's, I guess, a little bit, what have we just talked about touching on some of those? And now we can see a little bit more of some of the field examples you you saw these mint plants or you saw you were talking with and consulting some with, with these weren't you Dennis yeah and you know it's interesting because as we go back through and all of that information that you just gave us Steve based on the functions and what the biology does and how it helps protect that plant is this was a field of mint um, very high sodium level if everybody remembers in the springtime it was fine but because of water irrigation yeah. water yeah. Um, we had high sodium levels coming in about June. And again, that goes back to the idea of a lot of times we need to identify where is our sodium coming from so that we can try and stop adding to the environment um, or at least try and stop it or mitigate it based on where it is coming from. But the interesting part about this is you look at these roots on this mint plant, and this was across the entire field because the high levels of sodium, they, it had no biological activity whatsoever. I mean, it's not a sterile soil environment, but it did not have the community that it needed in order to protect itself from this high salt environment. And when we look at the, all the things that Steve has talked about here today is the dreadlocks or building that buffer or that filter and tying that sodium up. You know, so often we, we get tied up on biology, having a function of building soil health or nutrient availability, but it's also plant protection. Yeah. I mean, some of their job is specifically to uh, warn that plant of some problems and then protect it from a, a salty environment. Resilience. Resilience. Yeah. 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 Oh, definitely. And so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of really what their function is here. This, this field here, uh, we did go in with the DS, we went in with humates. And again, we always talk program, you know, the biology needs more, it needs more than just biology. It needs food, it needs oxygen, it needs water. Um, and we need to, uh, you know, kelp is a great stress reducer. When we, we can we've, utilize. Yeah, we've got, do you want to flip ahead to that slide or do you want to catch up to it at the, here at the end? Well, let's catch up to okay. it when we get back to it, but we can go 
You know, um, we, we so often talk about this, the Great Salt Lake. We've all seen this picture, but you can see the white, wow. the, the high. So nothing would grow here. Um, and this was a section, it was about a half acre section of this orchard that because of a low spot, because of drainage, because of where it was at, um, he just didn't try and grow anything. Um, we came in with the Spectrum BS, uh, two applications with humates, fish, and a lot of calcium. Again, it's a program, it's not a product. Yeah. Um, and are able to grow trees there now, peach trees. Go back one slide. Sorry. One of the things I want to point out in this scenario is, no, go to the next. <laughs> this is an organic grower. Yeah. Um, so he has no weed control. Okay. But if you look early on the right picture, you can see we've got a few weeds kind of struggling within that environment. You go uh, to this picture to the left where those uh, cannabis plants have, or hemp plants actually, had uh, grown quite a bit. And yet we still have a little bit of weeds, but nothing tremendous. And then we go to just prior to harvest. And you can see, I mean, we have some weed pressure there, but nothing crazy. And that a lot of that is because of the fact that it's just not a great environment for plants to survive. Yeah. Um, you know, this is still a very high sodium area. We are treating basically, as I say, only planting areas. So you can see the peach tree in the background. Um, that area we had done a cover crop specifically in that planting zone with the Spectrum DS fish, calcium, kelp, to build that soil health prior to putting those trees into that environment. And on this uh, planting of these trees, I believe we had about a 98% success rate. We did lose oh, a couple. Wow. Yeah, um, even in that salty environment. Keeping them in the salt. And prior to that, anytime he had planted trees in this area, he had basically none that would survive. Yeah. Um, so, by doing this, getting that microbial community functioning within that soil environment and building that structure and tying up some of that sodium, we have a, a chance for that root to actually get started and for that biology to attach to that yeah. root, create those filters. You know, you had mentioned one of the things a little bit, Steve, about um, potassium uptake. And we know so much that potassium uptake is critical to regulating that plant and how much moisture is that mm -hmm. plant gonna mm -hmm. lose if it has a potassium deficiency, yeah. I mean, you can just build. I mean, as we said, we could talk about this for days, probably just on the different aspects of how this all function and how this all works. And, you know, you were looking at your original slide. You talked about sodium chloride. One of the most one of the common tissue analysis or plant sap analysis I see when we have high sodium, we also have high chloride. And chloride, yeah. Because that separates out, goes into solution, it's available to the plant. Yeah. We have a lack of calcium. Yeah. Um, so all of these things are critical when we have high salt stress within a soil environment and we don't have the biological activity in order to support that plant and function within that environment. A lot of that is just making nutrient available in a state the plant can use it. It's not filling itself with something it doesn't want yep. because the calcium or the potassium is not available. Well, and you talk a lot about excesses being oftentimes more damaging. Sodium as an excess is potentially devastating to the plant. Um, again, sodium is a cation. Think of all the other cations that we need in that plant. Calcium, uh, manganese, magnesium, <laughs> the, the potassium, the list goes on. So as we increase our, our you know, we, as we fill the plate with sodium, we have less of everything else. And yeah, I just, when, when you're mentioning the potassium, it, it just kind of reminded me that we, we like to create little, you know, comfortable bites. But the reality is all of these things are happening all the time. So as we have these microbes that are feeding potassium, yeah, they're not just potassium mobilizers that through the rhizophagy cycle are feeding the plant potassium. They're also feeding phosphorus. They're also producing the volatiles. They're also stimulating root hair development. So it's, it's just this incredible complex network that is just this constant back and forth. Oh, let's see. I kind of want to skip ahead. So yeah, you mentioned the idea of creating these zones. I wanted to mention this one. This was this was years ago. Um, this was research over, I believe, in Dubai. But yeah, I mean, this is sand. I mean, this is literally desert sand. 
and the water they had access to was incredibly high salt. And their goal there, the, the project was green the desert, and the goal was just to try to get something to grow. And the initial applications, the initial testing, nothing was working, which, I mean, it's desert, kind of makes sense. You can't just apply water in the desert and expect things to grow. And in this case, it was salty water. So with this, a lot of humate and biochar was applied, trying to build um, up. They, they didn't really have access to compost, so we went with humate and biochar because those were commercially available. Um, trying to build some organic matter, trying to build some sort of CEC sponge. And after uh, a couple pretty heavy doses with the Spectrum DS, the humates, um, and the char, as well as the kelp, as well as the calcium, all those other things that we talk about as part of the program. They were able to get plants established. But again, that idea that you mentioned only in this zone. So we're going to focus on um, these zones and trying to create an, <laughs> an oasis of life. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. In these areas um, as the plants are growing. Uh, here, another one that we worked with, strawberries, fairly, strawberries pretty sensitive to salt. Uh, and you can see the damage along the growing edges. Um, and then the, the DS was used and the new growth kind of was able to grow through uh, that stress environment. Here is an interesting one, uh, working with John AEA. Um, they had tomatoes that all oh, through the roof, 1300 um, part per million on tissue analysis. So this was this was before SAP. This is years ago. Um, tissue analysis, 1300 part per million. They did, and it was interesting. They did um, try to foliar. So they did not only a drip. Oh, and it still says Spectrum Extra. Yeah, <laughs> not only a drip, but a foliar application of the Spectrum Extra, and within four weeks, it had stabilized out to around 200 part per million. Um, 84.6% reduction in the plant. And uh, their, their guess, John's guess, was they were going to lose about 70% of the plants um, before this happened. And they didn't lose the plants and they were able to actually harvest. Um, here's another one, Dennis. Do, do you want to talk about any yeah, of these? This, touching was, on this, these? this was peppers in Arizona. Um, a lot of this was under drip. Again, coming from the water, we look at a very high concentration rate yeah. when we look at a drip type scenario. Um, and so this was where Spectrum DS, you can see the crusting on the soil. Remember, mm -hmm. we talk about crusting. We talk about respiration, breathing, all of those types of things. One thirty second microbes. of an inch yeah. shuts it all down. Yeah. Um, but what you can see is uh, a little bit of the farming practices were changed based on how they watered. And then also the DS was used in this scenario and made a significant difference in overall crop health and yield. Yeah. And, you know, we can go on about this, you know, for a long time based on looking at results based on building a program specifically for a crop in a given situation. I was talking to a grower uh, just yesterday uh, pertaining to just this, it was, it was identifying where is it coming from and then what things do we need to yeah. do to fix it. Um, and a lot of times that's getting, talking with the grower, getting an understanding of what they're growing. You know, one of the things we haven't even talked about yet, and I think you have a slide in here, is the plants that you're planting. Some are going to be more tolerant to salt than yeah, others. That's true. You know, so a lot of times it has to do with the crop and what the level of, you know, we may look at a sodium level that we think is not excessive, but if we have very sensitive specific crop, crop in yeah. there, it is excessive. Yep. So there's a lot of things that have to be understood when we start to take a look at this. And I and plant sap analysis is, is really starting to shine light yes. on this based on the excesses of sodium yes. and also chloride within that plant. Um, because of plant sap analysis, where we didn't used to see it before with tissue analysis. Yeah, and I mean, that <clears throat> that brings up a good point. I mean, if you have the opportunity in your rotation to plant a crop that is less susceptible to salt, I mean, alfalfa does a bit, not high, high salt, but it does a bit better. And oftentimes it can actually accumulate some salt. Yeah. So as you're feeding it to um, your livestock, it will have accumulated some of that salt and it can actually be a great way to get a little salt into your animals. But if it fits into rotations, finding crops um, that will help alleviate or hyper accumulate some of the problem can be good. And Dennis, with these peppers, I thought it was interesting. We were chatting. I mean, you 
sometimes you think about drip being you're using less water, therefore it's a better situation. But in this situation with, with high evaporation rates, low amounts of water, but the water does contain salt, they were creating a, a more and more, instead of a zone of life, they were kind of creating a zone of death in right. that area. Yeah, because you're not leaching, you're not flushing anything yeah. out at short amount yeah. of water cycle, you're concentrating it in right around the root of the plant. Low rain environment, Low so rain not, environment. not a lot of a chance yeah. there. And it's, you know, it's funny you talk about alfalfa, One uh, working with Gary Redding, when he was with AEA, mm -hmm. took me by a alfalfa grower um, that sodium issues um, and literally his worst field at the highest sodium level turned by the end of that year, turned into his best alfalfa field by just doing some of these practices that we're talking okay. about. And we don't even have any of those pictures in here. No. So, I mean, I mean, quick reminder here, we're pretty close to the end. Um, salt index, if you're already struggling with high salt, high sodium, if you're already struggling with these problems, pay attention what fertilizer you're using. Again, with a lot of organic, but I can't say all organic um, because we have seen situations where our compost contains high levels. Even sometimes humates can have a high level of sodium. So paying attention to what you're using, how you're using it um, makes a big difference. So, I mean, first and foremost, reduce, 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 reduce. If you know you're having a salt problem, cut out as much as you possibly can. Uh, I have a note here. If you don't need 500 pounds of chloride, don't use a chloride form. And I can't think of any crops that need 500 <laughs> pounds of chloride. So that's a, a pretty strong hint in the direction of don't use chloride forms. <laughs> well, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. No, and, and you know, you're, I, I love at the bottom, you have tests, don't guess, and, <laughs> and you had mentioned that. I mean, when we talk about our compost, I know we've we've said this a lot, but I'm still seeing <clears throat> compost oh, analysis with really yeah. high yeah. sodium levels. Um, we're, you know, and we're going out to the tons, to the acres, yes. um, you know, with dairy manure, um, any of this stuff, raw dairy manure, yeah. we're seeing that. Um, you know, we start to think about culper sulfate or the foot yeah. baths or chloride, and that's concentrating in this dairy product mm -hmm. and in these dairy lagoons, and we're using that. So we really have to get that information out there of test, don't guess, so that we don't increase the problem. Because like I say, I see it more often in agriculture that excesses are causing a much larger problem than any deficiency. Yeah. yeah, and that's, I mean, a great point. If you're using tons of a product, oh, it doesn't have that much salt. But if you're using literally tons, all of a sudden you've added tens to potentially hundreds of pounds of salts through those. Uh, supplement displaced ions, um, especially calcium. Calcium is oftentimes what suffers the most, so especially early season calcium. If we're going into an area that we know that we have high salt, uh, early season calcium. Um, so get rid of as much salt as you can. Add the displaced ions, cations in this case, calcium um, most notably. Organic matter is a great sponge. Humates are a great addition. Um, and if you're using testing, make sure you're testing. Um, but compost materials can be a great way. Uh, hormones, I mentioned hormones to help alleviate some of the stress. And the hormones I'm referring to here are kelp. Um, some, some kelp products applied as a foliar, applied through the ground um, with our salty environment crops can make a big difference. So calcium, humates, um, a little bit of kelp, uh, biology. And the, the Spectrum DS is, is a great way to help inoculate the plants with the PGPR, the beneficials, as well as some halo tolerant organisms, um, some organisms that are going to help alleviate some of the stress for the plant as we're trying to grow in these environments. So it's doable. Um, we need to work together. We need to pay attention to what we're doing and how we're doing it. And we, we'd love to hear feedback. We'd love to work with you on more of these, these, uh, these fun fields and some of these fun problems. So at this point, I think my half hour is probably up. I'm going to guess that my half hour is up. Yeah, <laughs> we pretty much used all the time. I you started know. late though, well, so you probably have okay. another 10 or 15. Oh, okay. I'll just, I'll just keep going and let's see if we have, do we have any questions? I started a video back up, but I can't even see us. So, oh, well, uh, when plant goes through drought stress event, what does it do to the age of the plant? Yeah, no, I mean, senescence. And I mentioned a little bit the ACC deaminase. Uh, ACC deaminase is a um, molecule that's produced by some of these uh, drought stress mi microbes. 
Uh, and what it's doing is it's decreasing ethylene levels. Ethylene is one of the primary plant uh, communication molecules that speeds up senescence, speeds up um, development. So if a plant senses a lot of stress, it'll increase its ethylene levels. As it increases its ethylene levels, it's a, it's, it is turbo mode to get to seed production trying to get that plant to survive for the next generation and develop seed. Um, this can be an okay thing, uh, and this can be a very bad thing. If it's a salt environment that we can get our, ourselves to grow through, um, then we, we want to slow that senescence down so that the plant has more time to develop. Otherwise, we're going to drastically reduce our potential yields. Um, having salt generally is going to decrease our yields um, but if we have too much ethylene, then we're going to have minimal, minimal to no yield. So yeah, using some of these ACC deaminase producing organisms does slow down that aging process. Let's see if we can read another one. How much NPK calcium applied uh, analysis? Um, soil analysis to start off with, um, and tissue analysis, sap analysis to follow up with. But we need to have a good idea. I mean, test don't guess. We need to know where we're starting off. Um, and I mean, there are times where we'll look at somebody's analysis and say, yeah, you don't need any any nitrogen this year because it looks like we're doing pretty good or we're going to go pretty minimum nitrogen or yeah, let's be careful with our potassium, especially early season. So, so Steve, we're, we're going to need to chat more. We're going to need to look at soil analysis. We're going to see, need to see what's going well, on, the CEC, the soil type, all those different and things. And crop specific. What yes. are we growing? Yes. You know, are we growing carrots or are we growing 300 bushel an acre corn? Yeah. And yeah, that's a very, very good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you see that? Let's see, plants with roots a few weeks after emergence, even though they start well and good roots, seed treatment, microbials. I'll see, I'm trying to understand this question. Yeah, I'll contact him on that. Okay. Okay. Steve, looks like you have another question. Dennis is gonna to check in with you. Uh, let's see, Rochelle, I've seen programs with PSB. What's the advantage of PSB? To spectrum and and you touched a little of this on on uh, your last presentation, Dennis. And part of part and I'll let you speak to it more. But part of the idea of PSB versus DS. PSB stands for phosphate solubilizing bacteria. DS stands for drought stress. So you are working with a situation where they needed phosphorus, but they were also struggling with with too much salt. So they were having a drought stress. You guided them towards the DS, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah. And, and so what I always do is I always say we have to fix the excess before we have to worry about the deficiency. Um, so if we have the PSB generally I see is a great inoculum, especially for uh, where we have uh, <clears throat> phosphorus in that soil environment, but we're still yeah. in a deficiency or even times where we have low phos. We understand we have low phos and we have a plant deficiency. And so the PSB can help uh, greatly help make that available. Um, so when we have an excessive sodium issue, I would always recommend that we do the DS and let's try and reduce that stress off of that plant so it'll actually um, start to actively grow. It can take nutrient up. It can photosynthesize as it's yeah. designed to do. Yeah. And we can, and we can always supplement with phosphorus as a soil applied or foliar applied application to carry that plant through until we get that stress off of that plant. Um, so a lot of times the program is based on what the plant need. Yeah. Um, and again, my opinion is always fix the excess before manage the deficiency, but always try and fix the excess. Yeah, good point. Let's see, Gary. Oh, Gary, great point. Gary's pointing out basically if you have, uh, when you're measuring your EC, if you have a dehydrated soil, it's going to show a lower EC than after you rehydrate it. Because as those salts crystallize out, um, your EC is not going to look excess excessively high. We need to have Gary on here. He, he, he should give one of these presentations, I think, coming up here soon, Gary. We're, 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 we're going to tap you on the shoulder pretty soon here, but no, that's a an guest excellent speaker. point. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, but no, that's an excellent point. If our uh, moisture level is too low in the soil, 
our EC readings can be falsely low. As we rehydrate the soil, we basically resolubilize. Remember that idea of a solute, those materials in water in solution, uh, we're going to see a higher EC. So uh, like with bricks, if things are dehydrated, things get weird. If soil's dehydrated, things get weird. So if we're trying to measure EC and our soil is too dry, yeah, we're, we're definitely gonna see, um, gonna see some trouble there. And, and that's one of the points that we point out. There's a lot of good tools. You, I was thinking of the bricks meter. Uh, easy measuring yes. all of these things. Yeah. You have to have a very good understanding of what you're doing and what you're dealing with when you make recommendations off of those. So you can get yourself in a little bit of trouble sometimes when we just take one test or one sample and we don't look at the bigger picture. Yeah, and no, I thought, I guess I pulled the slide out of here. I did have um, one that mentioned using uh, EC meters, but no, definitely a good point. Uh, EC meters can, can be a, a great tool uh, in the field to help give you a better idea of how salty you are. And, and talking to Dr. Anderson, um, too salty is like energetic diarrhea. Uh, and too little salt, too little electroconductivity, and you end up with very little energy movement. So good, good points. All right. Well, I think I think we made it through most of the questions. Yeah. Well, there, there's just one question. It sounds like timing of humates, kelp, calcium, compost, biology early is earlier rather than later is better. And what I always yeah. say is no, no matter what we're dealing with is if we can get the get ahead of the problem yeah. before the plant is under stress or whatever the situation might be, it's much easier to overcome than trying to fix it after it's broken. Oh, um, definitely. Well, and I mean, yield potential, the, the more damage that you do to a baby plants, the, if you think about your yield potential as a balloon, and every time we have a stress, we're poking holes in that balloon, a baby plants with damage is is very large holes very quickly deflating that balloon's potential yields. Um, does that make any sense? It, it makes does. sense in my brain. It's, it makes it makes sense up the, here. Well, and that's uh, I'll I'll explain that's it for scary. you. Steve, that's scary. That's <laughs> scary. No, any anything we can do to restore do stress increases yield. Yeah, especially That's early. Early I mean, on. thinking about corn, all the research into the critical points of influence. Corn, wheat, yes. orchard, apples, cherries, yeah. every crop that I can think of, the earlier we can start making changes based on any deficiency or any stress is going to increase yield. Treat your babies right. Yep. Treat your babies right. That's, I guess that's a pretty good note to end on. Well, well, thank you, everybody. Sorry, I didn't, I should have worn my mask. I, I should have dressed like Sam with my, uh, Batman. well, my Batman mask. Okay, yeah, there, here, we'll put our regular mask too. back on. I now. guess, there. I guess on that note, no, 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 no,